it truly is an honor to be here. And how many of you are excited about Family Month this month? Yep. I, ha- I have to be honest, it- it's one of my favorite months here at the POL. We, I love getting together with my family, with my church family, and coming together in unity and in love. I love seeing all your faces. I know y'all can't believe that, but I love seeing y'all. I love watching, seeing everybody dressed up, not so dressed up. I won't call you out, but no, I'm just kidding. It's good to be here this morning. I, I was telling my wife yesterday, I was kind of finishing up my lesson and everything. I said, man, I really think God's going to do something good in the house this morning. Amen. I feel like he's giving me a word. And this morning, I want to talk about this. Seven steps for building a godly home. Seven building blocks to making the place we dwell and rest in a godly atmosphere. So God feels welcome there. The home is such a beautiful place. We laugh there. We cry there. We nurture there. We love there. We feel sorrow there at times. Sometimes we feel pain. But at the end, it is where we dwell and where we make our place. And we have to make it an environment where not only we want to dwell in, but where God wants to dwell also. Amen? So if you would like to take notes this morning, I encourage you. Not because I'm a fantastic speaker or whatever you may think, no, because I really do believe God has given me something. So I encourage you to take notes this morning. Open your ears to hear. I believe God's going to bless us. Amen. Let's get into it. First thing we need to talk about in building a godly home is building a firm foundation. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears this saying of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. The Lord has given us a clear view into where we need to build our foundation, upon a rock. Where even when the floods of life come against us, or attacks of the enemy, or even this world, upon the firm foundation, our homes will remain standing. I have three sub-points in this, three ways to form that foundation. Number one, prayer time. Prayer time. When we establish prayer time in our homes, it's a powerful thing. This applies to families, Marrieds, even singles, our homes must become a place where God can speak to us. And when we speak to him, he hears us. I'm talking about the type of prayer time where we gather together as a family or you gather together by yourself. It's not just those quick prayers, but it's a moment with him where he can speak and move. James 5, 16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Prayer is an absolute necessity if we want greater things to happen within our homes and our families. It needs to be a priority, not just an afterthought. And when I say afterthought, I'm talking about, you know how sometimes we're going through a day and we say, man, I forgot to pray. And we say a quick little prayer. No, that's not what God needs. God wants to say, I, God, I set this time for you. And for me, it's in the mornings. I wake up before my family and I sit there and I say, you know what, God, this is your time. Speak to me. Use me. Anoint me. Show me the things I need to do to lead my family into the places you've called us to go. Point number two for forming the foundation, faithfulness in Bible reading. Opening up our word and reading these scriptures in our home, it's a powerful thing. Because when we open up this word, we're opening up God and we're reading what he has for us. In Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is where we find direction, strength, encouragement. It's where we find our faith our doctrine, the things we build our personal lives on, our spiritual lives on. This is where we find it. True understanding of this word comes not from just flipping through it quickly and saying, oh, well, I'm just going to read this quick verse. No, it comes from studying it. Get you a notebook. Get you a pen and paper. Read this. You'll be amazed what God begins to move on you. and You begin to write down things and begin to show you and reveal things to you. And you become more powerful. You become more strengthened. And you find more peace in those times. And if we get this word, we allow him to be the true light to our path. Because we know that even in this world, it can get dark at sometimes. 
whether it be on the job, whether it be in our home, whether it be in church, things start trying to come against us, but we always keep this word in us. It lights our path. It lights up a way that says, you know what, this is where I want you to go. And we follow it. Amen? Number three. This one's going to sound random, but it's important. Serving. Serving. Serving the kingdom of God is a privilege. It's our jobs to establish in our homes that serving in any capacity in the church is important. We don't serve for titles. We don't serve for pats on the back. We don't serve for recognition from anybody. We serve because it's what we were called to do. Mark 10, 44 through 45. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus showed a powerful example of this when he sat with the disciples and washed their feet. Dirty, filthy feet of men that all walked with him. And would have, none of them wanted him to do it. Master, get up. Don't get down there. Don't do that. But he did it anyway because he wanted to show us what it means to truly serve. And if Christ can get down and do that, why do we have the nerve sometimes when we're called to serve and we're called to do something that we start complaining? I'm not just talking to him, talking to myself. I've lived through those times. Oh, my goodness. Here it is. It's that Sunday again. I got to wake up early. I got to do this. No, that's not how it should be. I'm here early on Sundays playing the drums. I don't do that because I love it. I do that because I like to sit in there when the presence of God starts flowing over his people. And you can sit back and watch and watch as the Holy Ghost begins to flow through this place. I don't, it doesn't matter what song it is that we get to, what's happening when the Holy Ghost moves in. There's nothing greater than that. And I sit in that drum kit sometimes and say, you know what, God, thank you. Thank you for giving me a front row seat to witness this, to witness what happens when your people gather together and begin to worship you and praise you. Now, how can that happen if every time I wake up on Sunday mornings to serve God again? And we all do it, if we're honest with ourselves. We all do it. Oh, my goodness, another early morning. Oh, my goodness, I have to stand at the door and greet people. I don't even feel like talking to my spouse this morning, but I got to go to church. It's true. It hurts, but it's true. When we set the tone in our homes towards serving, we must be excited and passionate about serving his kingdom. We need to show our families that it's important. If I sit at home every morning and complain about doing stuff in the church and my five-year-old little boy hears that. This happened, this happened a few weeks ago. I'm going to share this. I love sharing personal stories because it helps everybody relate. My son, it was, I think it was Saturday night or maybe it was even, I think it was Saturday night. He came in the living room and he said something that just blew me away. He came in there out of nowhere. He said, I don't want to go to church tomorrow. I looked at Aaron, and I, I said to myself, I said, well, first of all, <laughs> if that was my house growing up, Lord. <laughs> Boy, we would have been praying through, Lord have mercy. They would have been laying on the hands, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but because I was raised in an atmosphere like that, this is what I told him. I said, Maverick, listen to me. I said, this is the place we go to to grow to love, to embrace others. I said, this is a place of worship. You should be excited to go there. You should be excited to go to Sunday school, to learn more, to learn scripture, to learn God's word. I remember, yes, it was made into us in our home and instilled in us, but I was always excited to go to church. I wanted to see my church friends. I wanted to play drums. I wanted to do things. I wanted to live a life for God. And I was excited to go there. And I said, Maverick, Every Sunday we get up, we should be excited. We should say, God, I love you. I'm excited to go to your house today. And he, he did it for us. Here you go. But I think he got it. He hasn't complained about it since, so I think it worked. But here's the last point I want to leave you for that section. We make time for the things we find important in life. We need to make sure that those things we find important are important to him not just important to us. Number two, 
The second step, they build on godly own. Partake in good fruit. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, and inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Church, we have to make sure that we're rooted on a good source. We're rooted in a good source for our home. Rooted in the word, rooted in doctrine, rooted in holiness. Rooted in the things that we know can make a home powerful. When we are rooted in these things, those fruits that we begin to bear should not just be shown in our home. They should be shown outside the home as well. The enemy wants nothing more than to gain access into our homes. We need to be careful of the people that we come in contact with on a daily basis. On our jobs, sometimes in the church. You got to be careful who you're sitting by and letting your root system, root system grab onto. Because it can very quickly turn into advice and then influence. Let me tell you something. If you're hanging out with a group of people from work and you're the only one that's Holy Ghost filled, and there's about six or seven others that aren't, and you're not prayed up and you're not ready to go, let me tell you something. It won't be long. Your influence, it won't last. You can trust me. I've been there. I've been there. If they are not Holy Ghost filled and rooted in his word, then why are we allowing them to speak into our lives? Why are we allowing that root system to reach out if we know we shouldn't have been in that situation in the first place? I shouldn't have been hanging out with that coworker like that. I shouldn't have been letting that couple into my home that I didn't even know nothing about. But a few weeks in, next thing you know, you find out all these things about them, and that was in your home. I'm going to get real in here this morning, but I'm not going to apologize for it because God wants to do something in our homes. And I'm telling you what you need to watch out for. Just because those people look beautiful and lovely on the outside, mm, when we get to know somebody and they begin to influence us, and then next thing you know, you're getting home from work and you're agitated. You can't stand being around your family. You don't want to go to church. I wonder why. All that negativity we've been listening to, all that. Hmm. We can't slip into this mindset. We do not need to partake of the fruits of this world. All we need is him in all his glory, in all his wonder, all the things he's done for us, all the blessings that we've received. All we need is him. That's the kind of fruit I want to be partaking of. Whatever he wants to do, whatever he's done in my life, he must be the main source of fruit in our homes. Number three, having wisdom to lead. Ecclesiastes 7, 11 through 12, wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable to those who see the sun. For wisdom is a defense as money is a defense, but the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. Wisdom gives life to those who have it. There's something refreshing in knowing there's wisdom, there's life in wisdom. Wisdom to actively think and ponder on every step and every decision we make. Using his word, wisdom to seek first the kingdom of God and watch as things come into our lives. Proverbs 8, 11, for wisdom is better than rubies and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. Why is wisdom so valuable, like the scripture says? Because it allows us to make choices based on the knowledge we have from reading the word. It's wisdom that nudges us when we need to remove ourselves from a relationship. It's wisdom that says, you know what, this conversation, Pastor Charles, that I'm partaking in is not of God. I need to remove myself from this. It's wisdom that leads us and guides us and says, this is the path we need to go on. Because we have knowledge in his word and our wisdom begins to help us. Wisdom in the home does not just keep us safe, but also the ones around us. Because when we have wisdom, we lead with it. 
I know where to bring my wife and my son, and I know where not to bring them. I know where to walk with them as a family, and I know where not to walk with them as a family. I know what atmosphere to take them into, and I know what atmosphere to never bring them to. Because that's what happens when wisdom comes into our lives. One choice, one choice, church, made in lack of wisdom has the potential to crumble a home. When we lead as parents, as spouses, or even as single people in our home, wisdom must be used. The actions we take in our homes must line up with the knowledge that we have received from reading his word and the lessons we have learned from other attempts to lead without wisdom. There is a difference between living in the past and learning from the past. Let me explain that a little further. Living in the past is this. I'll never recover from that mistake. God's never going to use me again. I'll never make it. My family's never going to see anything because I messed up too bad. My church won't use me. My friends won't talk to me. It's never going to happen. But here's what it's like from learning from the past. Oh, I made that mistake, but what did I do to get there? God, show me the path I took because I don't want to take that again. Show me who I need to go to for help. Show me who can strengthen me. Put me around people that are going to support me instead of bring me down. I don't need to surround myself with people that are going to say, yeah, you're right. God's never going to use you again. No, I want people that are going to say, you know what? God can still use you. It doesn't matter what you did. You can use that as a testimony. We need to start learning from our past instead of living in it. And lastly, for that point, we must learn to lead with wisdom in our home. Lead with it in every decision you make. When we go to the grocery store, when we go to work, when we come to church, lead with it. Everything matters in this life. Trust me. Even if we think it's this small, it matters. Amen? Number four, honesty within the home. Proverbs 12, 17 through 19. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. The truthful lips shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with others in your home. Benjamin Franklin said this in a quote, honesty is the best policy. We want to create a healthy atmosphere in our home. We need to start being honest with the people around us. We can create a healthy atmosphere in the home, start being honest with the people around us. I take that approach like this in my own personal life. This is how I do it. Me being the extrovert that I am, if you know me, you know that I like to party. That's me. Let's go. So I'm always happy-go-lucky. And this is what I used to do. I would get home from work at my old job and My wife would ask me, how was your day today? I'm like, it was great. It was fantastic. It wasn't. It was horrible. (laughs) It was horrible. My boss was wild. The people I worked with were wild. It was bad. It was a bad day. But through realization, through prayer, through understanding things, you know what happens now? She'll call me after work, baby, how was your day? I said, you know what, babe? It was rough. I dealt with some things today. You know, some, some people on the job said some things or, My boss said something, and it hurt me in this way. I said, it made me feel like I wasn't wanted. I I hurt. It just, it wasn't a good day. I said, but I made it through. God's still good. It was a good day, but there were some points in it. And here's what we think of as leaders in our home and as humans. We think that when we're honest like this, we'll be judged. Or better yet, our family will look down at us because we're weak. No, that's the complete opposite. You see, my family needs to see me at my worst. They need to know that I'm able to be honest with them even in the hard times. Because then when my son or my wife has a hard day, they know that, well, dad went through that a few weeks ago. He can help me. Because they saw me at my worst. And when we begin to live without the courage and the strength to Use honesty. We take on a mentality that we don't need that in our lives, right? And we begin to portray a version of ourselves that's not the honest member of the home that God wants us to be. So every day when we get home from work, we pick up the mask and we put it on. 
hey, baby, I had a great day at work. Fantastic. I put that mask down when I leave the house and I go to work. And I put on my work mask. And I'm cutting up with my coworkers and doing your thing, living your life. And then I put that mask down and I pick up my mask. This is the one that's going to hurt. I pick up my church mask. And I come here like I've been praying all week long. Like I've been living and walking in the spirit. Like I've been laying on the hands of people at the grocery store. And I've been, I'll tell you what, the Lord's been moving. <laughs> but that's not the case. We come in here with a persona of ourselves that's not even close to the truth. When everyone in this room, they just want to see you be honest too. Pastor Charles don't have no problem if he comes to me and says, hey, hey, Brother Jonathan, how was your week? And I say, man, Pastor Charles, it was rough. He doesn't have a problem with that. None of us should have a problem with that. We should accept honesty, not just from our family, but from our church family as well. We've got to be able to embrace each other. Our pastor talked about that Wednesday night about unity. What a great message that was. We should be able to embrace everyone. There's, no, there's nothing that should be holding us back. Be honest about your day. Be honest about your feelings. Don't hide behind any feelings that the enemy tries to place on you. It's okay to be honest in the hard times. It's okay to be honest when nobody else wants to listen. But I'll tell you what, my wife don't want to listen to me. I'll make her listen. I'll keep talking. Lord, have your way. I love her, though. Our greatest moments in our home will happen through honesty. Number five, be an example. First Timothy 4, 12 through 16. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be made evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. This one's tough. Because when we strive to be an example, that means other people are watching us. The example we set doesn't just have to be uphold in in our homes. It needs to be uphold outside the home in the workplace, in church, in the store. Our example has to remain the same everywhere we go. I can't teach my son to love others, and the second I come in contact with somebody, I talk about him. I can't tell him that, Maverick, we need to love people around us. And every time I come in contact with someone, man, I can't believe they stopped to talk to me. I can't believe they thought that I wanted to talk to them. And slowly but surely, those little comments like that will fester and grow in his mind. And next thing you know, when somebody at school asks him about church or something like that, I don't want to talk to you. It'll come out. I can't sit back and expect my wife to find an altar in prayer if I can't find one myself. I can't claim to love Christ and I don't love others. I can't reach others if I haven't allowed God to truly reach me. There's a kicker. We want to teach Bible studies. We want to reach out. Let God touch you first. Let God minister to you in your home. Let God show you the way. Let God fill you. Being an example is a lifestyle. But here's the concern I have this morning. We want the benefits of being an example. We want the benefits of it, but we don't want to put in the level of consecration it takes to be that example. See, because when you want to be an example, there's a level of consecration that comes with it. I was watching, you know how you get on them rails on YouTube and, oh, Lord, I mean, you'd be in there for hours. Anyway, I came across one the other day. It was a podcast, and there was this uh, lead singer from a band was on there. I'm not going to name the band because, you know, somebody knows it. Oh, my God. Mm. Anyway, no need to judge anybody. But so the lead singer of the band was talking, and the guy 
hosting the podcast, asked him, he said, were you all a Christian band? And the lead singer said this, and I told my wife this the other day in the car because it stuck with me. He said, all the songs I wrote and I was singing, that's what was on my heart. That's what was being put on my heart to sing. He said, but my band members, listen to this, my band members did not want to, how do you, what's the word, uh, portray something that they weren't to Christian listeners. Because they said that they couldn't uphold the lifestyle that was required to be labeled a Christian band. I told Aaron, I said, that's crazy to me that people in a secular band can understand consecration better than us. They knew that if we are labeled as that, it comes with a different responsibility. It comes with a different label. Those parties we were going to, we can't do that no more. The way we talk outside of our music, we can't do that anymore. And it blew my mind. And I told my wife, I said, that is just crazy. But it's true. We want all the benefits of it. Pastor Charles, I want everybody. I love being around people. Yeah, I hope I'm being an example. But we love that feeling. But we don't want to give up what it takes to do it. To be a true example is to die to the flesh daily. To choose light even in the dark places. To choose peace over anger. To have faith when others are lacking it. We must be the example that chooses to raise our hands in worship and not sit back with our arms crossed, wondering when the song is going to be over and the pastor is going to preach fast and quick so we can go eat. Hmm. Be the example that chooses others before themselves, even if it means sacrificing our time for them. You mean to tell me, Brother Jonathan, being an example comes with sacrifice? Absolutely. Absolutely it does. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Oh, man. Hmm. Sacrifice paves the way to becoming an example. When we show others around us and in our homes that we aren't afraid to sacrifice for them, They will begin to follow us because they know if we're willing to give up things for them, we're worth following. We're worth it. We're worth it. My family will follow me because they know I'll give it up for them. I'm doing something. Matter of fact, I was studying yesterday, Pastor Charles. My son came up to me. Dad, I want to go play outside. Let's go. Sacrifice the time. Sacrifice the time. It's our job to maintain the trust put in us to lead by example. Be the example you'd follow. Be Christ-like. Not just sometimes, but daily. Be the example you want to follow. I want to follow somebody that's in their word, that loves God, that loves coming to church, that loves being a part of this assembly, that loves unity. I want to be following people like that. When the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room on that day, it fell because a group of believers followed an example set before them by Christ. Jesus never let anyone into places that he did not go himself. Hmm. In the storms, remember, he was with him. When he was flipping tables in the temple, they were with him. He won't take you anywhere that he hasn't been before. We must not be afraid to be an example, even in the storms. Our families and those around us need to see us lead, even when the waves are crashing in. Even when this world is falling apart, Our families need to know that we can still lead. And lastly, for that part, we need to walk the walk even when the path is dark. We need to be an example and trust the light that leads the way. We got to walk this everywhere we go because we never know who we're going to come in contact with. There's no way this morning I could sit back and lead everybody here. But I sit up here this morning and I teach this lesson. And two days from now, you run into me in the grocery store, and I'm the complete opposite of what I just told you. There goes that example, Pastor Charles. And I use myself as an example because it can happen to anybody. Number six, make your home a place of peace. (laughs) 2 Thessalonians 3.16 
Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Luke 10, 6. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Isaiah 27, 5. Or let, them, let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Paul gives us a powerful farewell in this text. Live in peace. What a tremendous thing to live in. Our home should be filled with peace. People should walk through the threshold of our home and immediately say, something's different about this place. Something's different about this place. When people come to visit, oh, man, there's peace here. There's love here. I've had coworkers come to my house with their wives. Uh, this was at our old house. And when I got to work the next week, my buddy told me, he said, man, your house was just, he said, it wasn't just anything, man. I said, it was God. He said, that's what happens when we allow him to dwell in a place. He makes it peaceful. Mm. What brings peace into a home? A relationship with the Prince of Peace. The same God that said, peace be still in the storm, can say, peace be still in the storms of your home. When you think your world's falling apart, when you think there's no other way to turn, he can do it. It's in that foundation we talked about earlier, when the prayer time, when the Bible reading, and the serving all come full circle. When God looks down on our homes and says, look at the love flowing from that place. Look at that. That looks like a place that I can dwell in. That looks like a home that I want to sit down. When they begin to pray, I want to listen to them. They have something to say to me. They're worshiping me. They're not just sitting there every time asking me for everything under the sun. No, they're searching for me. God, lead me. God, guide me. Welcoming the peacekeeper into our home is a life-changing moment. Not only are we welcoming the Lord to dwell there, but we are inviting him to our most intimate and private place. By taking this action of inviting him into our private place, we not only receive peace from him, but we also place our trust in him. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. When the peace and trust begin to mix together, things begin to happen. When the peace of God floods our homes, our trust in him turns into direction from him. And he not only becomes a peacekeeper, but he becomes a director of our paths. What a glorious and triumphant moment for our homes when we begin to let God be our peace and lead us where we need to go. Amen? Number seven. My last point, but certainly not the least. Have a voice in your home. Luke 10, 18 through 20. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be in any, by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We have to have a voice of authority in our home. Now, I'm not talking about sitting over your family and ruling with an iron fist. No, 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 no. I'm talking about spiritual authority. We've got to be able to raise a voice when the enemy begins to come against our home and against our family. But here's my greatest fear this morning that I've got to share with you. We, be, we have replaced authority with complacency. We've been rocked to sleep by the struggles we deal with on a daily basis, and we've come to terms with the fact that it's okay. Hmm. Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. A table that was prepared for us to confront and overcome has turned into a place where we dine with our enemies instead of removing them. What are you talking about this morning? I'm talking about we sit at a table chairs all around. We sit down with our depression. We sit down with our lusts. We sit down with our anger. We sit down with our hurt. We sit down with our pain. We sit down with our struggles and we dine with them and we let them speak. Negativity's there. Everything's there that we deal with and we allow them to speak 
And all the while we're sitting at one head and God at the other. And he's sitting there like this. Wait a second. I, I got something to say. But he can't hear us because we don't have the authority to silence the table. To silence our depression. To silence the things that we've been dealing with. And we sit there and we allow ourselves to take it. And the longer we sit there, the harder it is. I refuse to sit at that table and watch my family struggle. I refuse to sit back and not take authority over things I should have taken authority over long ago. And that struggle in our homes is something we should have taken care of years ago. But nobody said anything about it. Well, I'm telling you this morning, it's time to take authority of those, over those things. You want your home to be powerful, you want your home to be filled with peace, take authority over it. We, uh, these past few weeks, it's been about two weeks, my son's been having trouble um, going to school, leaving his, leaving his mom, leaving me. He misses us. It's never been a problem before, but it started happening soon. And uh, we pray together every morning. That's a thing we do. We pray separately, but we pray together as a family. And we've been praying for him and stuff. And I've been going in his room before Aaron even gets up, and I've been praying with him and talking with him. But it was two Sundays ago. We were sitting in our normal spot. And God spoke to me, and he said, Jonathan, you need to take authority over your family. You need to get the oil. You need to lay your hands on them. And I said, God, first thing I said, listen how we have excuses. I said, God, I didn't bring no oil. <laughs> well, should have brought it. <laughs> but thankfully, brother, brother Nathan Walker was there, and I told him, I said, man, I need some oil. I need to lay hands on my family. So he, he went and get some for me. He got it. And I sat there, and. My wife can kill me for this later, but she's also been struggling at work lately. There's, there's nothing wrong with being transparent. There's nothing wrong with honesty, right? Amen? She's been struggling too. So I sat there, I knelt down in front of my family, and I took that all and I laid it on their hands. You know why? Because the enemy has no hold on my family's mind. Come on. We've got to wake up this morning. I know we're in the 9 a.m. Sunday school, but God can move even in here. But we've got to come to a realization where it doesn't matter who's around. Other people can't pray for us. I don't care. God told me to do it. He told me to do it now. So I laid hands on my family, and I took authority over that. Touch his mind. Touch his heart. Let peace flow with him. Go into that school. I don't know what the situation is, but, God, you can move. You can do it. God, touch my wife. It doesn't matter what she's going through at work. You are greater than that. That's the kind of authority I'm talking about this morning. Hmm. When we take authority, that's when chains begin to break. Those mountains that have been building up our whole lives that we can never see over, they begin to crumble because we take authority and say, you know what, God, I don't want to look at that mountain anymore. I don't want to look at that circumstance I've been dealing with anymore. It's time for you to do something. Amen? Because when we start taking authority, guess what happens? The enemy starts trembling. Because when that name starts coming out of our mouths, Jesus, he can't help but say, oh, no, I can't go there anymore. I can't dwell there anymore. I can't mess with their minds anymore. Come on, church. I can't mess with their minds anymore because they started calling a name that I can't even come around. When you start claiming authority over your homes, that's when stuff begins to break. You want chains to fall? You want to sing about break every chain? Yeah, but let authority come into your home. I refuse to sit back and watch my family be bound by anything. No, 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 not on my watch. We're going to continue to pray together. We're going to continue to have peace in our home. We're going to continue to be strong together because that's what God wants us to do. Everything we have discussed in this place this morning, and I'm wrapping it up, every step that we've gone through, does not just need to be upheld at the home, but every single place we go. You better walk with peace. You better walk with understanding. We need to walk with wisdom. We need to walk with authority because we never know what we're going to come in contact with. I truly believe without a shadow of a doubt that if we embrace these things that we talked about this morning, if we embrace him and everything that comes with it, there is nothing in this world that will be able to come against us. Amen? I want to do something this morning. I have five minutes left, and that's what I wanted to have. Everybody stand up. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do this morning.
we're going to raise our hands and we're going to be able to begin to take authority over our homes, over our minds, and all the things that the enemy's trying to come against in our lives. Y'all can do that? I know church ain't starting yet, but there ain't nothing wrong with the Holy Ghost flowing before we go into service. Amen? Come on, raise up your hands. God, we love you in this place this morning, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I pray for every mind in this place, Lord God, that your power will begin to flow over us, Lord Jesus, that your spirit will begin to move in this place, Lord God. Whatever you're going to do in this service this morning, whatever guest comes into this place, Lord God, let your Holy Ghost power begin to flow over us. Open our minds, open our hearts to do the things that you've called us to do, God. Let us not sit by the side, Lord, but let us be an example of what you want us to do, Lord Jesus. Let your power begin to flow over us. Touch every home, touch every family, touch every man marriage. Let your power flow on us this morning, God. Begin to move, Lord Jesus, not just in this place, but in our homes, God. Oh. Yes, God, we magnify you. We worship you in this place this morning. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, we thank you. Jesus' name. Now, doesn't that feel good? I feel ready to go now. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? But thank you, thank you, seriously, for listening this morning. I felt it, I felt it. But God's going to do something great in our families this month. Everybody believe that, Amen. We're out a little bit early, but that don't mean you can't go get your kids. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you.